Well, hey, everybody, and I want to say welcome to this first module of the Problems of Children and Adolescents class. We're calling this module Foundations. And what I want to do through this little mini video lecture is just to summarize some of what you're going to be reading about in the lecture notes this week. And I'm going to do this at the beginning of every single module, give you a little brief introduction as to what you're going to be reading about in both the lecture notes and in the textbook and highlight just a couple of things for you. Again, this is not going to be very, very long, but again, I just want to highlight a few key ideas for you, which I'll do, like I said, every single uh, every single module. So again, just to kind of get us oriented to what we're doing in this class, this is the first of 11 different modules in this class, and we're going to take them uh, one at a time every single week. Uh, this class is called Problems of Children and Adolescents, and it really is what it says it is. We are going to be talking in this class about kids and some of the struggles that they often face in our world today, especially those that we encounter as we work with them in the social services setting. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in just a second or two. With every single module, you're going to have a little video like this. You're going to have a set of web pages like some lecture notes that I have posted for you. There are some handouts that I've posted for you in some of the modules. And then there's a discussion question and a homework assignment that is due at the end of the module. And it is due by noon, 12 o'clock noon. Remember, our magic time in this class is 12 o'clock noon the following Monday. Now, a little bit different this week because next Monday is Labor Day. Uh, Labor Day. So because of that, I'm giving you until Tuesday, noon on Tuesday, to get your work done, your discussion question, and your homework done for this first module. But normally it'll be at noon. It'll be uh, on noon, at noon on Monday. So uh, just a, every module will kind of be like that. And so you'll be working on your own. You'll be pulling some stuff out of the textbook. You'll be looking at some of the handouts. You'll be watching this, these little videos. But really the main thing you're going to be doing is going to be reviewing my notes that I've posted for these lecture notes that I've posted for you. And so this first module is just a foundation introduction module. And I wanted to ask you this question. Do you remember what it was like when you were a child or an adolescent? I'm sure we have some people in the class who are in their 20s. We might even have someone in, their in this class this semester who's 18, 19, 20. But probably most of us are above that. We're beyond that. And so we're into our adult years. And I don't know what kind of memories you have of your teen in your childhood years. But this class is about kids, and all of us can connect because we have all been children and adolescents at one time. And so you know, like I do, that there is no such thing as a perfect childhood, and there's no such thing as a perfect child. And so like you, I went through typical kinds of struggles and issues as a part of childhood because that is just sort of what is typical for childhood. You know, it is not easy. It's often kind of messy. And kids oftentimes have can, oftentimes have a number of different issues and struggles that they face. That's just a part of growing up. And uh, a lot of those problems that you and I experienced as kids and teenagers, we grew out of. A lot of us did. A lot of us uh, grew out of those as we went into adulthood. And maybe you have kids or grandkids in your house and your kids will grow out of many of those problems. But we know that there are certain issues that kids face that really are kind of beyond the typical normal, I'll say normal kind of child and adolescent kind of struggles. And so we talk a little bit about that in the lecture notes and the module this week. The idea that really what this class is about is really about kids who experience problems that are beyond the realm of the normal or the typical. So we're talking in this class specifically about social service types of problems like learning disabilities, ADHD, intellectual disabilities, um, autism, and then a, a range of mental health issues and then also to abuse and neglect. So this class is really not about the typical everyday kinds of things that kids and teens struggle with because kids and teens do struggle with lots and lots of different things. So that's an important distinction for this class is that this is really a class where we're talking more about kids who whose issues or struggles, although they may have lots of resources and strengths as well too, they have some limitations. They have some things that they deal with in their lives, whether it's mental health or whether it's developmental or behavioral or emotional or whatever it may be. So that said, that's kind of just a little simple kind of intro. Now, we could talk a lot about kids and their struggles, and I want to just highlight for you something that I highlight for you as well in the lecture notes. One of the key things when we work with kids 
is that we always have to look at the context or the environment. The word context is just a fancy word that just means environment. The environment that kids are in because they are developing emotionally and behavioral and psychologically and physically, the environment that they live in is so important. And we can't say enough about that. And so kids develop within context is the phrase we use in child and adolescent counseling. Kids develop within context. And so it's important to always understand the age and developmental uh, stage that a child is at. It's always important to look at family environment and educational issues and all kinds of stuff when it comes to working with kids. We're gonna discuss a little bit of that this semester, but that's always important is, is, is to look at the importance of context that, that, that children live in, the neighborhood that they live in, uh, the family that they are around, and how key that is when it comes to understanding and making sense of some of the problems and the issues that kids may face a little bit. Now, now here's the thing that I want to say. I just mentioned family, and I want to say this as well, too. And I highlight this as well in the lecture notes this week. I want to dispel a really, really important myth that is around, that, that oftentimes people hold when it comes to child and adolescence, children and adolescence, and problems. A lot of times we think that kids who have problems come from families that have problems. And that if a kid has a problem, well, then it's an adult's fault that that child has that problem. And I want to just kind of say this just up front. That is not always true. Now, kids do develop within contexts and the environment in which they live, including their parents and their siblings, play a huge role in the stability of their lives and how well they feel loved and nurtured and accepted, that is absolutely true. But it is not true to go so far as to say, well, you show me a kid who's got a problem and I'll show you a parent who's not doing their job. A lot of people hold that idea in our world today, even in our field today, and it's just not true. Um, I worked for many, many years as a counselor, a therapist, working with families and kids. And one of the things I learned very, very quickly was that oftentimes moms and dads and grandparents and siblings can do everything kind of right and kids still struggle. I mean, kids can grow up and feel loved and nurtured. They can go to good schools. They can go be in church every single Sunday. Mom and dad aren't divorced. Mom and dad don't abuse drugs. Mom and dad are real stable, provide a good role modeling for them. And kids sometimes still struggle. They can struggle with learning disabilities, ADHD. They can struggle with autism. They can have mental health struggles. Absolutely, it happens all the time. So children, are, parents are not always responsible and at fault for their kids or for kids' problems, even though the context is really, really important. Um, if you've ever had me for a face-to-face -face class, you've heard me say that I am not a parent basher. I don't believe in parent bashing. I'm a parent myself. I have two children in their 20s now. But even before I had kids, um, I was very, very fortunate that I had really, really good mentors and role models because that's kind of how I entered. I, I kind of entered the field as a case manager working with at-risk kids. And I worked in a residential treatment facility working with kids and their families. And I was just very, very fortunate that I had good role models and good mentors and supervision from, from the clinicians who trained me uh, in that they taught me, Glenn, it does no good to beat up on parents. Don't parents parents are not going to start doing better if you put them down. You need to engage and you need to um, empower and you need to enable moms and dads and grandparents to help their kids. So I'm not a parent basher. I don't believe I'm not a believer that every single time a child struggles, a mom and dad or an adult is not doing their job. That's not always true. Now, sometimes parents do play a role and sometimes we do know that kids can and do struggle sometimes because of the environment in which they live and because of the mom and the dad or whoever they're around or not around. And so, but, but I, want to, I want to make sure I highlight that even though kids develop within contexts, that not every single time a child struggles is it automatically the fault of an adult. I want you to let go of that idea as we kind of get started. That's really, really, really important. One of the things we do talk about though in this module you're gonna see is I do talk about the important idea of trying to understand some of the different ideas about where do problems come from. That's a very common question we get. I get as a professor. If you're going to go forward and work as a social worker, as a counselor, a lot of times people come and want, and want to know, well, why is this happening? Where does this problem kind of come from? 
And so I want to highlight for you a couple of key ideas. You may have never heard these terms before, but these are very, very important terms and ideas, concepts to grab onto as you are a human services student in there. And I give you some information and actually a couple of case scenarios to highlight these two concepts in the module this week. They are the terms equifinality and multifinality. Equifinality and multi or multifinality. Well, what does that mean? I always cover that in this class. Uh, it's also covered in your textbook as well by your authors in a great in a great detail. Equifinality is a term that means this. Sometimes there's more than one cause to a problem. It's real simple. We often in our brain, we, we, it's easier for us to understand a problem if we can say, well, the reason why he does this is this. The reason why she acts this way is because her mama doesn't or something like that, right? We talk as if problems often have one cause. That's usually not common. What's most common is there are lots of little bitty things, lots, multiple small problems lead up to a larger problem. And that's called equifinality. It's, a, it's just a fancy term that just means oftentimes there are multiple causes to one problem. Why is this kiddo not doing well in school? Why is he in trouble with law enforcement? Why is she struggling uh, with anxiety? Whatever it may be, whatever the problem may be. Well, there's oftentimes multiple reasons and variables and factors at play, not just one. So that's so when, when, when we talk like that, the term, the actual you know, technical term for that is what we call equifinality, multiple causes of one problem. Number that, that, That's the first thing. Multifinality is kind of similar. It's a little bit different. And what it just means is this. Similar experiences often lead to different results. Multifinality. Similar experiences often lead to different outcomes or results. And you, you know this experience probably. I, I do. Um, what this means is that, for example, imagine you have a family of three kids and all three of those kids grow up in a home where a mother has a mental health problem, a father abuses alcohol, and there's domestic violence between the mother and the father. And they grow up in this chaotic environment, unstable, chaotic environment where there's mental illness, addiction, and, and domestic violence. Well, what effect is that going to have on those three kids? Well, it's going to have some level of effect, but what kind of effect? It depends. It happens all the time. Would it, be, would it be possible that one of those children may grow up and themselves struggle with substance abuse because they saw their father drinking? It's possible. Is it a given? No. Many people grow up in homes where there's alcohol and they grow up with alcoholic parents, but they don't become alcoholics. Not always. Is it possible that a man or a young boy or young girl who grows up in domestic violence themselves Maybe may grow up and may as it may be a, maybe a son or a boy may then become abusive towards women or a woman may allow a man to be abusive towards her because she saw maybe her mother doing that. Is that possible? Absolutely, it's possible. It's actually one of the risk factors of domestic violence. Is it a given? No, not at all. Many people grow up and grow up in domestic violence situations as children, and they don't deal with domestic violence at all as adults. Is it possible that one of those children could actually grow up as an adult and have healthy relationships? Absolutely, it's possible. It happens all the time. And so what we mean, so the term multifinality just means that oftentimes similar environments create different outcomes among people. Um, I had we, had we had a good conversation in my class, one of my classes last semester, about post-traumatic stress disorder. And the example was being, that was being used in class was by a, 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 a military combat veteran who was a student of ours. And we were talking about PTSD. And he shared a great example of how when he came home from combat, he did not struggle with PTSD like a lot of his friends and his buddies did. But they did. They went through similar experiences. One guy comes home and does pretty good. Another guy comes home and has all kinds of negative effects. It happens all the time. It, ha it just, it happens for, for different reasons, it happens all the time. So whenever we see that, that's called multifinality. Equifinality means oftentimes many little problems causing one big issue, right? Many causes for one problem. Multifinality means similar experiences often leads to often lead to different outcomes. Those are two key ideas to always keep in your mind 
when you're working with people and their problems, okay? And you're trying to evaluate and kind of assess. I mentioned that in this class because I think it's an important idea to keep in mind. We think about kids, especially, multifinality, equifinality. And then lastly, one of the things you're gonna read about in the lecture notes is I give you some different theories, just a little overview of some different theories. Speaking of equifinality, the idea that multiple things can be at play in someone's struggle, I give you some different theories about why we believe and why we know sometimes kids can struggle. There's the biological genetic kind of approach where we know that some problems, some kids can sometimes struggle with problems because they inherit a genetic predisposition to mental illness or a learning disability or ADHD because of the biological genetic component. The, the idea of, of what we call the biological theory. There's what's called learning theory, the idea of learned behavior. And sometimes kids just pick up and model the behavior of the people around them and they just repeat what they've seen. Um, I summarize for you briefly what's called attachment theory. Attachment theory is where kids want to feel nurtured and loved by those around them. And if they don't feel that nurture and love and attachment, they're gonna try to attach to somebody or something else. And so we see attachment theory. There's what there's Freud psychoanalytic theory, the idea of you know kind of unconscious motives and, and projection and those kinds of things. All of those things oftentimes are at play. And so we sometimes see, for example, if a kiddo is kind of struggling, is it possible that one of the reasons why he's struggling is because maybe he doesn't feel connected to his mother and his father and he acts out as a way to get attention? That's possible. That's called that, that, that would be an example we call attachment theory. But is it also possible, too, that maybe the reason why he acts out is he has an older brother who he sees acting out and he doesn't see mom and dad you know, disciplining this older brother. And so he watches how mom and dad treat older brother and he thinks I can get away with that, too. It's called learned behavior. Could that also be at play? Absolutely. Both of those could be at play. Could it also be possible, too, that part of why he or she acts out is because genetically he has inherited what we call a learning disability, like dyslexia from his mom and his dad or mom and or dad. And so he doesn't feel intelligent at school. He's called ignorant or dumb or stupid. He feels that he feels that way because he, he knows he he's not able to keep up with the rest of the kids. So he has this genetic or maybe a mental health issue like depression or bipolar disorder. It's more of a genetic thing. Is that possible? Absolutely, that's possible. All of those could be at play, right? So I summarized for you a little bit about some different theories that we, 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 want, we, we always want to take into account and to affect when we think about the different reasons why and causes for kids and their problems. So again, we could talk a lot, a lot, a lot about just the basic introduction into understanding how to approach, how to approach children, adolescents, and their struggles. I want to say this before we kind of go. This class is called Problems of Children and Adolescents. It has the word problems in it. I want to highlight for you that even though we're going to focus this semester on problems, because that's what our class talks about. Um, Kids always have resources and strengths, because that's true for all of us. All of us have resources and strengths at our disposal in addition to struggles and problems. That's true for kids too. I hope this semester you won't uh, be too discouraged in this class. I hope that you won't, uh, by discouraged, I mean this idea that we, may, that we may focus a lot on struggles and problems. I hope that that won't be kind of a negative thing and that you won't take away from that conversation. The idea that all kids have our problems. We know that's not true. Kids have lots of resources and strengths, just like families do, right? So we are going to talk, though, this semester a little bit about some of the typical kinds of struggles, though, that kids have. So go through the module. Take a look this week at some foundational information. Next week, on Monday, September the 7th, module number two is going to open, and we're going to get down to business in module number two. We're going to begin talking about some of the specific kinds of struggles that we see in children and adolescents, and we're going to start talking about intellectual disabilities and other developmental disorders next week in module two. Okay. So go through work this week. I'll see you next week in module two. Have a good one.